All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. Thank you all for sharing um, where you're from. Uh, those that are just joining can go ahead and continue to um, let us know who you are and where you're from. Uh, it's kind of nice to see where everybody's represented from. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Professional Webinar Series. My name is Tom Wickman, and I'm the Assistant Director for the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program. Today's webinar is From Your Landscape to Your Table with Dr. Norma Samuel. She'll provide an overview of urban vegetable gardening requirements and provides tips for overcoming challenges in edible landscapes. This webinar is approved for one FNGLA, Florida Water Star, LIF, VBPR, and FDAC CEU. There's a $10 administration fee to receive a certificate for continuing education. Uh, we'll put a link in the chat box uh, to make payment for the certificate if you've not already done so. We will submit the CEUs to the licensing agency tomorrow, so make sure if you want the CEU to make payment by the end of the day. This is a part of the monthly webinar series held on the second Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. Our next webinar is on May 10th, is uh, Residential Landscape Management with Dr. A.J. Reisinger. Your microphones have been muted. Uh, please put any questions that you have in the chat box and we'll take them at the end of the presentation. Also, you'll see a survey invitation uh, pop up. Please take a moment to fill this out as it really helps us determine which programs to offer. And we're really starting to plan next year's lineup. So uh, please uh, take a moment to share those with us. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Norma Samuel is the Associate District Extension Director for the Central District with the UFIFIS Extension and Florida Friendly Landscaping and Urban Horticulture Agent based in Sumter County. She's got uh, a lot of roles she fills. Dr. Samuel received her bachelor's and master's degree in plant protection and pest management from the University of Georgia. She also holds a PhD in agricultural education and communication with an emphasis on international extension and a minor in nonprofit organizations from the University of Florida. Before migrating to the US, she worked with the Ministry of Agriculture in Antigua and Barbuda on a research station and with the Plant Protection and Quarantine Unit. She has almost 20 years of experience as an extension agent in the areas of residential and commercial horticulture, master gardener, and 4-H youth development. She has expertise in the areas of pest management, food systems, volunteer development, risk management, and human and organizational capacity building of extension systems. She is the current president of the Board of Global Forum for Rural Advisory Services, an international nonprofit based in Switzerland. She's uh, obviously very qualified. I'm so excited to hear her presentation and she's a great friend of mine. Um, so I'll, with that, I'll turn the floor over to Dr. Norma, Norma Samuels. Take it away. Thank you so much, Tom, for having me. And Tom has asked me to do the impossible, which is talking about something that I'm passionate about in an hour, but I will do my best to stick to the timeline that I've been given. Because we're federally funded, we must inform you that if you come to one of our programs and you think that you have been discriminated against, there are different ways that you can file a discrimination complaint. You can file a complaint by going online and to the US Department of Agriculture website and filling out a form there. You can also send a fax or email and there are different ways that you can make sure you get your, your complaint filed. Um, so hopefully none of you ever come to one of, of our programs and think that that's the case. But we just want you to know that because we are partially federally funded, we have to make you aware that if you're discriminated against, here's how you go about filing a complaint. And our programs are open to all. So today I'm going to quickly give you an overview of the nine FFL principles, and I'm sure many of you have been participating in these. 
sessions. And so I'm not going to go into each of the principles, but rather just mention them. I'll give you some vegetable gardening basics in order for you to be successful at vegetable gardening. There are some things that you need to know. And then I'll give you some examples of vegetables to incorporate in your landscape or those of your clients and fruit trees that you can also incorporate in your landscape. So I grew up on, uh, on a farm and I've been growing my own food ever since I was able to hold a hoe. So um, lots, of, lots of background uh, I have in this area. Now, many of the things that I'm going to tell you, I'm just gonna touch on them because we just have an hour but certainly do contact your local extension office to find out what classes they have available where you can get more in-depth information. So these are the nine Florida friendly landscaping principles. And while we're talking about vegetable gardening, they are still applicable, right plant, right place, water efficiently, fertilize appropriately, mulch, attract wildlife, manage yard pests responsibly, recycle, reduce storm water runoff and protect the waterfront. So I will go into some basics pertaining to vegetable gardening that applies to most of these principles. The first thing you need to do is conduct a site analysis. In order for you to have a vegetable garden or if you're looking to incorporate vegetables in a landscape, you should select an area that has six to eight hours of full sun, especially if you're looking to grow something that has fruit. So if you're growing eggplants, peppers, tomatoes, you need that six to eight hours of full sun. If you're looking to grow something just for the greens like herbs or, um, or your brassicas like cabbage, that type of thing, then you can get away with about five to six hours of full sun because you're just growing for the greens. Select a level area, which most of the areas we have in Florida are level. You need to have good drainage. If you don't have good drainage, you'll end up with a lot of disease problems. So ensure that the area that you select has good drainage. Of course, you need to be close to a water source. So when you're putting in your vegetables, they don't like to be stressed. So you should select an area that's close to a water source. And I'll talk about some of these some more. Of course, the soil pH is important and I'll talk about that. Determine the size of the garden that you're going to put in. So if you have a client that wants to have a vegetable garden and you're gonna get that garden started for them, you know, find out some things for them. Do, does that client have previous experience growing vegetables? And if not, I would say just start with a 10 by 10 space. If they're familiar with gardening and, you know, and also how many people they're planning to feed or if they're planning to donate, that will determine the size. And then the plant hardiness zone, and we'll talk about that a little more. So this is the USDA plant hardiness zone map for, for Florida. And so based on where you're located in the state, you should be able to find. You should be able to find. Um, you should be able to find where you are. So I am located in Sumter County, and Sumter County is zone nine A and nine B. So our average annual extreme minimum temperature in zones nine A and nine B ranges anywhere from between twenty to thirty, 20 to 30 degrees Fahrenheit. If you're down in South Florida where you're 10B or 11A, your extreme minimum temperatures are anywhere from between 25 to 45 degrees. Now this determines what you're able to plant and when you're able to plant. There's an excellent, excellent fact sheet called Florida Vegetable Gardening Guide. If you've never access this fact sheet before, and it's actually the most access fact sheet, I think, that we have on EDIS. I do recommend it. A lot of the things that I'll go through with you today are on this fact sheet. There's also now an app 
that you can go online, floridafresh.ifas.ufl.edu. You can go on that app, put in your zip code, and then it will you know, give you information on what you can grow the particular time of year for the area that you're in. So that helps a lot with helping you figuring out what to grow when. So in this fact sheet, there's information on the dates that you should plant your, your garden. So your spring garden and your fall, your fall vegetable garden. And it divides up this, the state into regions. We have North, Central, and South Florida. And sorry, you're not able to see a lot of this stuff that I have here, but you can find it in that fact sheet and also on that Florida Fresh website. So it gives you most of the crops that we can grow here in Florida and the time frame in which you can plant them. So if you take bush beans, for example, in North Florida, you can plant bush beans March through April and then August through September. For Central Florida, February through April, August through September, and September through April in South Florida. Now it's critical that you stick to these timelines. The University of Florida has you know, specialists that have done research on the ideal time to plant these vegetables across the state. And so I highly recommend you stick within those timelines. That's when you're expected to get the best yields, you'll have fewer pest problems. So for example, if you take um, production of collards, I put in my collards in the time frame that they recommend between September and February. And usually I put them in around, you know, um, November, December, that's when I put mine in. And we never have to spray really on our collards and cabbages because we put them in at the appropriate time. Now collards can take some heat. So right now our collards are still going. However, they, they're having aphids. So you'll see aphids, you'll begin to see caterpillars. So if you put in your crop too late, then you're likely to have pest problems. Another example is if you're growing tomatoes and you put in your garden too late, then you'll have problems in this late in the season around, let's say early June, you'll begin to see you have stink bug problems. You'll also notice that your flowers are not setting fruit. And that's because the temperature, the night temperatures are too high for the tomato plants to set fruit. So do stick to the dates that we provide you here. Um, in this table, it also gives you information on the expected yield per 10 foot area, the days to harvest, you know, planting spa spacing. And it also gives you the plant family. And that is very important because you want to know the family that your plants are in so that you can rotate between different families. So when you put your garden in, keep a keep a like a journal or a layout so that you know, here's what I plant in this area when, and so you can rotate. And that way it's a, a means for you to manage um, pest problems. So where do you begin? The foundation, of course. So soil test, soil test, soil test. And we recommend you get a soil sample. You can easily collect a soil sample kit from your local extension office, or you can just go online to the soil, um, the soils lab website and you find the, um, the submission form and you can collect the soil sample and you put it in a bag and send it off. So to collect the soil sample, you can go around the area that you're gonna have the vegetable garden and you select, you know, you use the hand spade or you may have the auger, but just a simple hand spade will do. You need to get down about six inches. You collect, you know, the soil sample from several different areas, mix it all up, make sure that it's dry. And then you put about a cup full in a bag, you send that off to the lab and for 
they will send you back a report and also copy your agent. And with that report, it gives you information on the nutrients that are available and what you need to apply and whether or not you need to lime, which is very rare for us here in Florida. Um, so I do recommend that you take a soil sample and get that analysis done because you don't want to be putting out fertilizer that you don't have to, because that way you're gonna be polluting the environment if you do not need to put out fertilizer when the nutrients already exist in the soil. So the garden design, it varies. It depends on the space that you have, what your clients want. So those are all factors to take into consideration. You can plant directly in the ground. So you see here at that top left photo, those were some students from a, a local elementary school in Ocala and they were planting directly in the ground. And we use strings to line up the rows so that they look straight. But you know, if you don't mind your rows looking crooked, you don't have to line them up, but it does look good when you have your plants in a, in a straight row. Um, raised beds, and you can use lots of different materials for raised beds. We do have a publication on EDIS, and maybe Emily could find that and add it in the chat for you. But we do have a publication on installing raised beds. You can also use containers and you can also um, do hydroponics, but we are not covering hydroponics today. For your raised beds, what I'll tell you is that you want to have them no more than four feet wide so that you can stay from one end reach to the middle, the other side reach to the middle. That way you're not stepping inside the bed. Mulch, of course, um, that is very important. You use mulch to reduce weeds, prevent erosion, to reduce the incidence of soil borne diseases. So many vegetable diseases are soil borne. So if you have a layer of mulch like what you see here, that puts a barrier between the soil where the pathogen exists and the foliage of your plant. So when it rains, it will prevent the, um, the mulch will prevent the um, pathogen from getting to the leaves of your plant and thereby reduce the incidence of disease. Your mulch also keeps the soil moist. It regulates the temperature. And of course it has a finished look. If you still read the newspaper, you know, by hand, certainly you can put out like two sheets of two or three sheets of newspaper on the ground first and then put out your mulch. That way you don't need, you know, you use minimal mulch. Your mulch should not be too thick. So I would say an inch, no more than two inches of mulch. But I generally use a very light mulch when I'm mulching my vegetable garden. Your pathways, you can, you can also mulch if you want to mulch your pathways. So just like humans need you know, vitamins to survive, it's the same way with our plants. They have essential elements that they need and they're divided into major and minor nutrients. And the major ones are your hydrogen, oxygen, and carbon, which they'll get from the air. Then you have nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, and sulfur. And major just means that they're needed in large amounts. Whereas your minor, these are required in smaller amounts, but they are just as essential as the major nutrients. So your minor nutrients are your iron, manganese, boron, chlorine, zinc, copper, molybdenum, iron, and nickel. So those are the nutrients that plants need. Now the pH, which indicates how acid or alkaline a soil is, affects nutrient availability. So if you look at this chart where you see a lot of the, the elements that I just mentioned, you can see that most of them are available between between the six to 6.5, you know, area, seven area. 
So when you, if, when you have a very low pH, you see that many of the nutrients are not available. Iron is avail highly available at a very low, at low pH. Whereas if you have a high pH soil, you'll notice that your plants turn yellow, a general yellowing. And that's because they're not able to take up, you know, take up iron. So it's important that you, you, um, you know what your pH is and the soil tests will let you know what that is. So your pH for growing vegetables around six to 6.5 is ideal. Avoid overliming, it ties up your micronutrients and phosphorus. So if you go back to this, you see when you, when you lime, you're raising your pH and so um, some of your nutrients are not going to be widely available. Below 5.5, you have micronutrient and aluminum toxicity, and you reduce root zone pH with ammonium sulfate. So if you have a, a soil that has very high pH and you want to reduce the pH, let's say you're growing blueberries, which you need a low pH, a lower pH for blueberries, you'll need to reduce the, um, you'll need to reduce the pH. And so you can do that with ammonium sulfate of potash or sulfate of potash, murate of potash. So those three items you can use. Now it does take time for the pH to change after the application of lime or sulfur. So don't think that you're gonna put it out today and by next week, the pH is gonna change. It does take time for that to happen. Now let's talk about fertilization and you can broadcast or incorporate fertilizer before planting. And when I'm doing raised beds, that's what I generally do. I broadcast and I'll explain um, broadcasting and some other ways of applying fertilizer in a second. So I usually broadcast the fertilizer and then rake it in because you don't want to leave the fertilizer exposed to volatilize where it turns into, into a gas. So you want to cover it over after you broadcast it. Um, you use a balanced or complete fertilizer. And there's a difference in terms, in terms of those two. So a balanced fertilizer is one that has nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in the same ratio. So you can have a one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one ratio. So an example of a balanced fertilizer is 666 or 101010. That is also a complete fertilizer because it has all three nutrients. So a complete fertilizer has all three nutrients, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's balanced. So a complete fertilizer that's not balanced would be like um, 1648. That's an example of a fertilizer that's complete but not balanced. So apply a balanced or complete fertilizer every three to four weeks. Now, if you have clay soils, those bind the nutrients a bit longer. So the nutrients is, you know, doesn't leach through the soil as fast as your sandy soils. So instead of putting it out every three to four weeks, you can put out um, the, the balanced fertilizer every four to six weeks. Now the 2% phosphorus rules for, for lawn does not apply to vegetable gardens because you do need the phosphorus for your vegetables to produce well. So that 2% phosphorus rule that we have for, for lawns doesn't apply to your vegetable gardens. So here's how you apply your dry fertilizers. So the term that I mentioned there um, first was broadcasting. So if, if this is your raised bed, which is the item here on the left, you see broadcast below, it means that you just sprinkle the fertilizer over the entire bed and then you rake it in. Then these are the three methods, the banding, the ring and the drop. We refer to those as side dressing. And with your banding, let's say these two circles are your plants and you just make a little ridge or rill you make along the side and then you sprinkle your fertilizer in 
and then you cover it over. Then the, with the ring, you make a circle around each plant and then you sprinkle your, your fertilizer and then you cover it. If your plants are close enough, you know, you, don't, you can just do one, one um, application here in the middle so that you're not putting out too much fertilizer in between the two plants. Then you have your drop where you're just dropping the fertilizer beside each plant and go. The disadvantage with the drop is that you're feeding just one side pretty much. You know, yes, you will get the fertilizer on the other side, but the plant will eventually get nutrients on that other side, but it will take longer compared to if you do one of the other methods. How much fertilizer to apply? The ideal thing is for you to do a soil test and then based on the soil test results, then you'd know how much to apply. Um, the general rule of thumb, in case you decide that you, um, you're not able to do the soil test because it's too late and the soil test results, it takes about two weeks for you to get that back. You can apply one pound of 10, 10, 10 per 100 square foot or 100 foot row. Or you can use two pounds of 5, 10, 10 or 5, 10, 5 per 100 square foot or 100 foot row. In terms of aluminum sulfate, in case you want to drop the pH, aluminum sulfate is 20, 0, 0. You apply two and a half pounds per 100 square foot area of garden. And if you're using blood meal, which is 15, 1, 1, you apply three and a third pounds per thousand square foot area. So this is just a cheat sheet, but ideally we would prefer if you do a soil test so that we, you'd know how much you, your plants exactly need. So in terms of watering, remember I said you need to have your water close, your plants close to a water source and you can use micro irrigation. So you can use drip or soaker hoses or other micro irrigation methods. And this is ideal because it's most efficient in terms of water, it saves water. It's about a 90% efficiency. And also it allows for efficient use of the fertilizer. If you're using overhead, you might be applying too much, too much water. And then you can, you know, with that, you'll have the nutrients leaching through the soil, or you can have runoff depending on how much you're putting out. Also with micro irrigation, you reduce the incidence of disease because you're not getting the foliage wet all the time. And that is ideal because we have a lot of fungal problems here in Florida on vegetables. And of course it reduces weed problems. So many gardeners, they, all they can afford is the overhead system and they may use an oscillating sprinkler like we have here, or they might hand water with, um, with a watering can. The efficiency on this is a lot less. There's a 50% efficiency in terms of water, um, in terms of the watering and you have a likelihood of more disease problems. Now, a question we get asked all the time, can you use reclaimed water for your vegetable garden? And the recommendation from the university is that you can use reclaimed water if, if what you're going to, um, if what you're going to eat is cooked. So you have, you know, heat being applied. So if you're growing lettuce, for example, you don't cook lettuce. So you wanna use potable water for that instead of reclaimed, reclaimed water. So think about that. And the same goes for um, rain barrels. The water collected in your rain barrels, we do not recommend it for vegetable gardens because you can have toxins from your roof, algae, bird droppings, um, but if that's the only source you have, um, the same applies as reclaimed wa reclaim water. If you're gonna be cooking it, 
then, but the preference is for you to use potable water. So seedling selection, and most of the vegetables that you grow, you'll have to decide, or I should say the vegetables that you grow, you'll have to decide whether you're planting them from seeds or seedlings. So items like your cucumbers and your beans, your pumpkins, those are things that you can easily grow from. Um, you can easily grow from seeds. The seeds are generally less expensive than those smaller seeds like your, um, your peppers and eggplants and tomatoes. When you're selecting seedlings, you want to select healthy plants. So if you look at the purple bell pepper there at the top, you see how nice and green and even that looks. That is a good seedling for you to select when you go to the garden center. However, the eggplant at the bottom, that's one that you want to avoid because you can see that there's some yellowing on the leaves, there's some leaf spots, and you can see that there's possibly leaf miner and other things damaging this eggplant. So you want to avoid, you want to avoid that because likely you're gonna end up with a lot of problems. So select sturdy, um, select sturdy looking, looking plants. Avoid those that are already flowering because when you transplant them, you're going to have more of a shock. So the younger the plants are, that's a lot better than if you select an older plant that you're then going to transplant and then you have more of a shock. If you intend to grow your own seedlings, we recommend starting them six weeks from your intended planting date. So for us here in Central Florida, we usually get our vegetable garden in around March 15th. So it means six weeks before then, by the beginning of February, you should have your seedlings started so that by mid-March, they're ready to go in the ground. So what are the sources of seeds or, and seedlings? I am not advertising for any of these companies, but these are ones that, um, well, a few of the many that I personally get, um, I personally get seeds from. So you can also check your local garden centers, your big box stores, mail catalogs and online catalogs. So these companies and others that you may use you can find them online, but you can also order a hard copy cat catalog. Some of them still do that, and they will send you a catalog every year. Um, and so that's a good way for you to see, you know, what new varieties are out there, what you want to try. And when you go on to the Florida Vegetable Garden Guide, we have a few varieties listed on that site. That is by no means the entire list of vegetables that you can grow in Florida. So gardening is all about experimentation. So for example, at my home, we grow around 130 to 160 different varieties of tomato every season. So, and you may ask how much land do you have? I live on a half acre and a house take up part of that. So not a lot of land, but we're able to get a lot in there. So this is one harvest from my, from my garden. So now I'm gonna tell you about a few vegetables that you can incorporate into your, um, into your landscapes. Now, if your, if your client wants to do you know, a whole vegetable garden, then there's a much wider array of vegetables that you can select, but I'm just giving you a few here for you to think about that are easy to take care of. So one of the things that you can't grow wrong on is sweet potato. And so this is, an, is a, um, a photo of the extension office in Marion County where I used to work. And we had that area there that for a while, um, you know, my supervisor couldn't figure out what he wanted to do with it. So one day when he went to Gainesville, you know, Jack and I, we were mischievous and we went and planted it with sweet potato. 
And that is what it looked like. So sweet potatoes make an excellent ground cover. And look at the size of the sweet potatoes we got out of there. So not only do you have a nice ground cover, but you know, in about four months, you have great sweet potato that you can, that you can eat. Um, this is a photo that I took on a farm where you can see, and it, now is not the time to grow lettuce. So some of the things I'll talk to you about in terms of cool season crops is not the time for you to put them in unless you have a heat tolerant variety. But um, you can see here on this lettuce, you know, they're different, um, they're different colors and textures on lettuce that you can use um, to incorporate in your landscape to have good color. And you may not want to have too much of it, but you want to, to have just enough for the homeowner to use or they want to donate. So this is a photo that I took at the Botanical Garden in Texas, and these are mustard greens, and they have the Garnet Giant, which is the purple one, and the Wasabina, um, which is the green mustard greens. So you can see how you can play with the colors in your garden to give you this nice look with the purple and the green, and also with the... Um, with the foliage. So the purple one has, you know, smooth margin and the, um, the, the wasabina has, a, um, you know, is more freely. So mustard greens. Um, these are kale and like collards, collards and kale, they can take the heat more than some of your other, than some of your other brassicas. So kale, we still have kale going at our, at our home. And the photo on the right is, is um, from that botanical garden in Texas. And you can see how they just plant a strip of it along, you know, several rows of it along this path. And if you see it, it looks really nice. And then the photo on the left is a photo I took at a farm with that, um, that frilly kale. The only thing I don't like with the kale that's so frilly is that it takes a lot of washing to get the soil out of it if there's you know, dirt splashed on it. So it takes a lot more washing compared to this, um, this smoother leaf kale. So this is, um, this is at that botanical garden in Texas. So you can see that they have the mustard greens and the kales in a container. So just simply adding, um, adding your, your, your vegetables to a container that does have a, a great impact here. Another thing that you can add that would look nice is Swiss chard. And um, the bright light Swiss chard that has the yellow and purple and green stems, that's a great addition. And then you can do, you can do peppers. And um, there are lots of different varieties of peppers. One of the things that I must tell you, and some people don't realize, is that if you purchase green peppers, if you leave it on the plant long enough, it will turn red. And if you purchase yellow bell peppers, it will be green first, and then it will turn yellow. Um, this bell pepper on the right, I don't know the variety. It was just an assorted mix. The package was uh, said assorted mix. So they, they didn't really have names on those peppers. But what I liked about that bell pepper, and we grew that at home, was that the tree or the plant was compact, but it was just filled with these peppers. So these were yellow. There was one that came in the pack that was, um, that was purple. And so this would be a really nice addition to a landscape. And when you plant peppers in your landscape, these will go until the first frost. So they can take, the peppers can take the heat of summer. Same thing with eggplants. Um, I didn't add any eggplants in here, but eggplants are also another excellent um, addition that you can add to your landscape beds. 
So this is one of my favorites. It, it's called sorrel, Florida cranberry, roselle, um, whatever term you use. But this is a crop that was grown in Florida many years ago that's making a comeback. And I'm currently conducting some research on this on two farms here in central Florida. So we're evaluating four different varieties to see how well they perform. And we will have some publications that we will um, post on EDIS coming later this year, where we will you know, provide information on production of sorrel in Florida. But I usually plant it as a hedge between me and my, um, my neighbor. This particular one, for some reason, my husband decided he was going to get in my beside my flower bed at the front. So this is like at my front door. And you can see that it pretty much took over. It pretty much took over the walkway. So the walkway is on the left and towards the front. That's a part of the driveway. But hey, you have something that you can use. But Florida is a is um Florida cranberry is a lucrative crop. It has a lot of potential. You can use the calices for drink, for jams, wines, jellies, and the list goes on. And you can also use the leaves. So there's a, there's a chef here in central Florida that he uses the leaves as wilted greens. And one of the farms that we work with that, that farmer is super excited about growing sorrel because she's been able to sell and make money from the leaves as greens during the summer when we're not growing other greens in Florida. And then you see what the flower looks like. So the flower is, is really beautiful. And this is a relative of okra, cotton, and hibiscus. So okra is, a, is an excellent addition. The own, and you can see that the flower on the okra is very similar to the flower on the, on the sorrel. So okra is a great addition also. The only downside to okra is that they're very susceptible to root knot nematodes, but you can see the beautiful flower that you have here. So if you have a new bed that you're putting in, you know, you can plant okra the first, you know, the first season or two. However, after that, the, the nematodes are gonna find the, are gonna find your okra. So for me at home, we usually plant our okra in containers and we put the containers on a um, on a black plastic just as a way to create a barrier from the from the nematodes reaching it during the growing season. So this is an herb tower. So you have to be creative with your gardening. And so um, this is just right outside my, um, my back door. And I had this extra, um, extra landscape timber and I painted it blue, same color as my house. And I was like, oh, I'm gonna make an herb tower. So this has been in the ground probably for more than five years. It's about two feet down. And we just simply, um, you know, have some containers attached to it. So this is what it is. So I did, I, you know, use nails and connect the containers to the um, to the pole, and then I just drop a similar size container inside of it, and then you end up with this. And you can add, you know, drip to each one of those pots if, you, if you'd if you like. And then below I have different, um, different herbs in containers. So this is the below here on the left, this is what below it looks like. So I have mints in containers. If you're putting in mints in your landscape, I highly recommend that you, um, that you put the mints in pots because mints spread a lot. They will, take over your, they will take over your bed in no time. So put the mints in pot. And then of course you have basil and different color basil. So like the mustard greens, you can you know, be creative in using your basil. And we do have um, 
we do have family and consumer science agents that offer classes on how to use a lot of these things that I'm talking about. Um, this is outside our extension office here in, in Sumter County. So you see there's a lot of parsley in this bed. Um, there's some sage and there's mint and basil and oregano, and, um, not oregano. Um, there's there's um, rosemary, sorry, rosemary. And then there's, you know, flowers or ornamentals incorporated in there too. So Dusty Miller is inside here. So this is just another look that you can have. Rosemary, um, this is an excellent addition that you can put in your landscape. So I have a landscape bed at the front of my home. And I, you know, I have three rosemary plants in that bed. They're very drought tolerant, you know, easy to take care of. And so you can see here, this is a creeping rosemary that I took a photo of at the Botanical Gardens in Texas. And this is a rosemary um, tree that I, or plant that I had in my garden. Okay, so we're quickly going to get to fruit trees. Tom, how am I going on time? Uh, looks like you've got uh, about uh, between 10 and 15 minutes left. Okay, so I think I can do this. <laughs> okay, so um, I am from the islands. And so whenever we plant tree, we, trees, we don't plant trees just for shade. There must be something to eat from it. So if we're planting a shade tree, it's, it's a tree that has some kind of food to it. So it's the same concept that I have in my yard. So I don't have any shade trees in my yard. So any trees that I have are trees that are going to produce food. So we're very limited in terms of, you know, fruit trees that we can plant in Central Florida. The ones that we can plant, um, they do require chilling. And what the chilling refers to is the amount of time that you have um, between 42 and 45 degrees Fahrenheit. So those are, we refer to that as chill hours. So you need um, a certain amount of chill hours in order for the um, temperate fruits that we grow here in Central Florida to survive, or not only survive, but to produce fruit. So higher and lower temperatures satisfy the chilling requirement less efficiently. Inadequate chilling re results in delayed weak spring growth. Eventually plants become weak, non-productive and may die. Now, whenever you go to like a big box store, for example, you will find that they have fruit trees there that are fruiting and it may not necessarily be one that will do well in your area. So it's good that you do your research and know um, the, particular, the particular variety. So here is what the winter chill unit ac accumulation is for the different parts of the state. So if you're in, um, if you're in Sumter County where I am, you know, the chill hours that we get is between 310 to 420. 420 is on the high side. However, whenever I'm making a recommendation to, you know, my clients about growing fruit trees in Florida, I say select the ones that require 300 or less for Central, for Central Florida. So that way, if we have a warm winter, you will still likely to get production. So what you'll need to do is select, you know, find where your, your county is on this map and decide, you know, how many chill hours, you'll see how many chill hours you need. And then you decide, you know, what varieties you will select. So let's talk quickly about a few fruit trees. So, um, in this case, we're gonna go with blueberries first, not really a tree, but a shrub. And in Florida, you have rabbit eye and Southern high bush varieties that will do well here for us. 
Your rabbit eye variety is the best suited in Ocala and points north into Georgia. So that's your rabbit eye. And your southern high bush uh, from Gainesville South to about Sebring. So you can see from these photos here that blueberries, you know, they do make a nice, um, you know, a nice shrub that you can add to your landscape. Here are some varieties for the rabbit eye and the southern high bush. I won't go through them, but we do have excellent fact sheets online where you can go to find more information on varieties and growing blueberries. Now, in terms of blueberries, they do benefit from cross-pollination. Bumblebees are the primary pollinator, and we recommend that you alternate rows of different varieties to get a good cross. So if you're growing rabbit eye, you could, um, you could alternate like the Climax and Be Becky Blue. So instead of planting all Climax, you want to alternate um, different varieties. So let's go quickly to stone fruit. So your peach, nectarine, plum. And I haven't had much luck with plum. Some people do. So certainly try it, but I haven't had a lot of luck with plums. The advantages is that you get excellent quality and pro they're productive between 100 to and 50 to 300 fruits. And these are self-fruiting, meaning that you can have one plant or one tree and you're good. So you don't need to have several peaches or several nectarine or plums, just having one plant um, you're good. The disadvantage is that sometimes you, you have insect problems, you'll have to do pruning and thinning, um, and they have a short life. So peaches, for example, they live an average of about 10 years. And I can tell you, I had one that, you know, it declined right about 10 years. So, um, I'm just going to cover one or two peach varieties, but there's a lot of peach varieties that were developed specifically for Florida. So I'll go through this so that you know what you're looking for. So UF Gold is an example of an early season peach, um, and it ripens in about May. And notice that it requires 200 chilling units or 200 chill hours. So that is an excellent one to have. And then you have um, the UF Beauty. That is another one that requires 200 chill, chill hours. All right. Then if we go to Nectarine, you see that there's um, Sun Mist Nectarine, and that's one of several varieties that would do well here, and 275 chill units. So this is just to tell you that, you know, Whenever you go to the store, know the varieties and how many chill units they need. So if you live here in central Florida and you go to the store and you buy one that ha needs, you know, 500 or so chill hours or 400 or more chill hours, it's likely not going to give you fruit uh, many years. So you have it growing, but you likely won't get fruit. So pruning is going to be essential on your fruit trees. And we do recommend that when you get that plant, the first thing you do is prune it. And I know you'd be like, oh, I just bought it. It has all these fruits on it. But if you allow it to keep those fruits, you're going right into reproduction and you want the roots to become established first. So we recommend cutting that back about two feet. And so, yes, it defeats the purpose of you buying it with fruit, but you cut it back with two, uh, about two feet and you want the first year that it's going to be establishing a strong root system. And then as you, um, as the plant grows, then you can have a open, um, an open canopy like we have here. So some people get really deep into the pruning. Some don't. I am one, I'm a lazy gardener, so I don't get so deep into the pruning, but you're certainly um, welcome to do that. Figs, these are ones that are really, really easy to grow. So if you haven't tried 
any fruit trees yet, I highly recommend that you try, um, you try growing figs. They make an excellent specimen plant in your landscape. They do come down with rust um, in the fall, but that's okay because at the time when the leaves um, when the leaves get the rust, it's about time for you know them to fall anyway. So you just pick up the leaves and dispose of them so that you don't have the pathogen surviving in the soil. Um, some varieties of figs that do well are Celeste, Brown Turkey, and LSU Purple, and so. You can see them here. So the Celeste is a smaller one. The LSU purple is a larger variety. Um, persimmons, this plant and, and the fruits are from the tree in my yard. This is one that I highly recommend that you plant. There are two different types of persimmons. There's the astringent and non-astringent. With the astringent varieties, you have to let them ripe until they're soft, 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 or they they, um, they make your mouth kind of cottony or in the islands, we say they tie up your mouth. Um, the um, the non-astringent type, which is this one I have here, you can just eat this hard like you would an apple. Other fruits that you can consider, papaya, avocado, depending on where you are in the state. And there's lots of other places you can get information on EDIS. And the fruit portion of this presentation was adapted by, um, from one by Dr. Jeff Williamson on stone fruit. And if you ever have the opportunity to hear Dr. Williamson talk about fruits, I highly recommend you take that opportunity. He is excellent. I do have a Let's Talk Gardening YouTube channel. You can go there and see a lot of videos from my backyard. Um, and so I highly recommend that you go on and subscribe to the channel. I'm kind of behind on posting. I have a few things that I need to get up there, but um, there are a lot of videos that you can see how to incorporate vegetables in your garden. So with that, I'll take questions at this point. And sorry to rush so much. <laughs> Norma, thank you so much. You did cover an awful lot. Can you back up a couple of slides? Uh, someone was asking if you could go back to the papaya and uh, avocado links that uh, that you had. Sure. Now, when you're planting papaya, you want to have um, you want to plant more than one because they have male and female on separate plants. Uh, I thought I was sharing my screen. So why? Okay. Yes. So you have male, male and female on separate plants. So, and you don't know which is, which you're going to have until they begin to flower. So if you're planting papaya, I'd recommend you plant several. I've tried cold hardy avocado, but I live in an area of Marion County where I think the microclimate is colder than other places. So my cold hardy avocado didn't survive, but it probably would have survived if I'm one of those people who covered things down. I do not cover anything down. So you have to be able to survive on your own because I'm not going out to cover you. <laughs> I certainly understand that. I'm going to go back uh, to earlier in your uh, presentation. Um, this question was more about pH. Um, they said uh, most Broward County municipalities keep the water pH between eight and nine. Um, this makes lowering the pH very difficult. Do you have any advice for, for them? Yeah, so, so it's the same thing here for us in, in Central Florida. Some areas we have pH that, you know, is around eight sometimes. Um, what you can do is, you know, use the aluminum sulfate, one of those, fertilize, one of those fertilizers that will help to lower the pH. So um, that, would be my, that would be my recommendation. Um, and some people, what they do, they use like fertilizer that's for blueberries, 
you know, which is an acidifying fertilizer. So those are things that you can do. And your other alternative is to planting. Well, but it's the water you're, you're concerned about also. Yeah. I, I think your advice is probably the best, best she can do. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, the fertilizer amounts for blood meal. Um, do you, can you share, share that again? Sure. And remember, as I said, the ideal thing is for you to do a soil, a soil sample and you add your agent's name to, the, or once you put your county on there, they will send it to your local agent. And then once it comes in, you can call that agent and they will help you figure out what to use based. So you may want to use blood meal or some other type of fertilizer. They'll be able to walk you through um, how much of that particular product you need to use based on your soil test recommendations. Awesome. Can reclaimed water be used for drip irrigation? It can be used for drip irrigation, um, and that way it's putting the it's putting the water right at the right at the roots. If you're using like your soca hose or one of those that just and not the micro irrigation that still brings it up. Again, the key there is anything that you're going to eat fresh. Do not use um, do not use the um, the reclaimed water on it. But yes, you can use it for micro irrigation. When you're using micro irrigation, one of the downsides or not downside or maybe disadvantage is that you have to constantly um, unclog, your, your emitters may get clogged. So you'll have to check and you know flush your system sometimes. Awesome. Yeah, that's that's the big thought that I had. You might need a filter or something too. That that might be helpful. Um, how can you keep iguanas from eating everything? <laughs> well, that's a tough question. We don't have iguanas here in <laughs> in Ocala eating in in Central Florida eating our stuff. But I do see the photos of them down there in um in South Florida. That's a difficult one. Um, the problem I have up here is more with rabbits. And so, you know, we put up a little fence to keep the rabbits out of our garden, but the iguanas, they, you know, I don't know, maybe someone else might be able to give a recommendation on that since I'm not in an area with iguanas. Yeah, it's an, that's, it's always seems kind of foreign to me, you know, I'm, I'm a central and North Florida guy. Um, and so I, I've never really had to deal with, uh, with iguana issues. Um, yeah. But, uh, yes. Some of the South Florida folks maybe can, uh, can share some of their experience. How can you stop birds from eating tomatoes? Well, you know, it's nature. You have to plant enough for you and them. You know, but what I would say is that if you're planting tomatoes, you want to make sure you don't you don't have out a bird feeder. So yes, you want to have the birds coming to your landscape, but you won't put out a bird feeder. So for me, I remember one time my kids went to one of those, you know, Home Depot builder stuff, and they brought home the bird feeder that they made. And we're like, nope, unfortunately, that can't go up. <laughs> that can't go up because you're going to be attracting the birds. And they understood that. So um, it's one or the other. You know, if you want both, then you just have to plant enough for you and them. Learn to share. Yes. <laughs> what is the restaurant that cooks uh, sorrel? Um, I don't know the name of the restaurant. I just know that the, um, there's a, the, the farmer, she told me, and the name of the farm is Dirty Dog Organics. So you can look up Dirty Dog Organics and that 
that farmer, she is always willing to talk to people, really nice lady. So she can give you information, give you information on that. But I don't remember the name of the of the restaurant. Okay, I'm seeing on the, the chat some uh, some folks from South Florida are sharing uh, either some uh, bird netting around the base of some of the plants to help keep iguanas up down or that there mm -hmm. are uh, uh, some plastic circular guards that can be ordered on Amazon um, to help keep them off your plants. Um, so those are some of the thoughts that are coming from some of the um, participants. The, the other thing that I spoke about that birds usually get is your blueberries and some people, they put up bird netting. Um, for the blue, for the um, around the blueberries to keep out the birds. Great, that's but that's after they've set fruit. They usually do that. Are there simple ways to avoid issues with leaf miners? They seem to always damage their basil plants. Um, so for basil, on my herbs, I don't treat my herbs with anything. You know, so. I usually just pick off the leaves when they get that blotch. It's a blotch leaf miner on the basil. So I usually just pick off those leaves. Um, on your tomatoes, for example, you can use, for example, uh, uh, um, a horticultural oil and that puts a barrier on the, um, on the surface that the, the leaf miner moth doesn't like to lay its eggs on. And then you can also use, I think spinosad is registered for, um, for leaf miner control. So those are some products that you can use. When you're using, um, when you're using horticultural oils, you have to make sure that, you know, and we're getting close to it, you know, days when we have consecutive consecutive days of temperature 90 degree around 90 degrees so that's not good you'll have phytotoxic reaction yeah but generally whenever I see plants with the leaf miner I will just pick it off but there's some years when you get a lot of leaf miner what about loquats Loquats. So I had a loquat tree once. Um, it's easy to grow. However, my loquat tree came down with fire blight, which is a which is a disease. And so after that, um, I didn't put one back in. But they're very they're very easy to grow. Mm -hmm. Great. Can you show your chilling um, chart one more time? Sure. It's always such great information. Awesome. That way they can help, they can see where they are in the state and um, it uh, figure out exactly which, which varieties they need to, to grow themselves. Yes, uh, this person's yes. okra seedlings, uh, they seem to stop growing after they get about two to three inches. Um, any thoughts? So without knowing the symptoms, it could be a number of different things. So it could be probably Phythoptera or some one of those seedling diseases could possibly be the problem. Um, usually, you know, it's not in the ground very long at that point for me to say root, not nematode. So I would think maybe it's some type of fungal disease affecting, affecting it. But certainly reach out to your local extension office. So we're here to serve you. If you are out there working in your garden or working on a landscape and you see a problem you can't identify, take some photos. So you take a, a photo of the entire plant or tree, and then you take some close-up shots and you can email those to us or you can bring samples to the office and we'll be able to help you identify the problem. Super, got just a few more questions. Um, do longan trees grow in South Florida? I'm not familiar with longan. So someone from South Florida may, may need to answer that question in the chat. 
Yeah, or they can always check with their local extension office to, you know, get specific for their their county. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see, any vegetables that work with backyard chickens? Uh, <laughs> oh, vegetables that work with backyard chickens. So I don't do any chickens, but I would want to think that, you know, um, any vegetable that you plant would be fine, but you'll probably be concerned about your tomatoes. They may pick, they may peck your tomatoes. But um, I am self-sufficient in vegetables, but unfortunately I don't raise any chickens. So maybe someone else can provide an answer to that. Great. And a lot of people in the chat are saying that long gans will do well in 10A. Um, so down, okay. down in Homestead in South Florida. Um, Really good. Um, let's see, what is the address for the vertical slash container gardening info you mentioned? That would just be um, on EDIS if they searched. Oh, yes. So if you go on to EDIS, just, did, did Emily put that in the chat for us? Uh, she did about raised beds, I think. Uh-huh. Early on, yes. In the so if you go on to EDIS, once you go on to that, um, to EDIS, E D I S dot I F A S dot U F L dot E D U, there are lots of publications on there, pretty much about anything you need to know about vegetable gardening. If you don't find it there, contact your local extension office and we'll find the information for you. We may not have the answer right away, but we'll get you the information. Great. One last question for you. Can you please show your email again? Um, I think it was at the um, end of your I presentation. I did not provide my email, but my email is nsamuel, nsamuel at ufl.edu. But the ideal thing is for you to reach out to your local extension office. So even if you reach out to me, when I send your response, I will copy your local agent so that they are able to follow up with you. There was a lot of great comments about your presentation. Norma, thank you so much. Um, you covered a tremendous amount of information in the last hour plus and um, you know, gives everybody a good starting place on, uh, on where they can begin. Uh, just so everybody realizes this presentation will get posted to the uh, Florida Friendly Landscaping website. Um, so, you know, if you can share share this information with uh, your friends and neighbors, uh, colleagues, if they, you know, they miss something, they can always go back and listen. And you can always go back and listen to all the, the ones in the past that you may have uh, missed as well. So we do like to Tom, archive those there. Yes. Tom, someone is asking about the YouTube address. If you just um, Google Let's Talk Gardening IFAS, you will you will get to the web to the um to the YouTube channel. Fantastic, Norma. Thank you once again. I appreciate you taking the time. Everybody, thank you for joining us, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next month um, when we have uh, Dr. AJ Reisinger. Have a great right, day, bye everyone, and thank you.